Elizabeth Byrne, the relatively new president and principal of King's. Uh, I just want to say what a huge privilege it is for us to host uh, this event uh, with two such incredibly uh, distinguished uh, discussants. Um, uh, the Right Honourable Tony Blair, of course, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, and um, Sir Michael uh, uh, has recently uh, written a wonderful book, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward immensely uh, to the presentation and discussion we're about to have. Uh, I, I just want to say a word of introduction. Um, uh, the London University scene is now probably the most vital of any city in the world. Uh, King's is a huge part of that. Uh, we've cemented a place in the top 20 research universities in the world in our own right, uh, and we're getting ever stronger in many areas. Of course, we have a wonderful law school, a huge medical school, uh, but one of our real jewels in the crown is our incredible strength in public policies and social sciences and our interest across many areas of the university in governance. Uh, the Public Policy Institute has been a fantastic asset for Kings, uh, and the development of the Strand Group, taking advantage of our academic strengths and our geography to promote at the highest level discussions about governance, about how government works, about how things are done, has been incredibly important for us. Uh, I believe, and my colleagues at King's believe, that this is exactly what a top university should be doing, uh, especially one uh, uh, so close uh, to Westminster, Whitehall, uh, and much uh, of the uh, government structures in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is student-run. Uh, it engages our students and gives them an experience of uh, uh, things that are incredibly important to them in their personal development. Uh, it's wonderful that it's sponsored by Hewlett Packard and we're totally committed at King's to the partnership between university and industry. And of course this brings government in as well, the trifecta. We've had an incredible mix of high profile speakers and attendees, but I have to say, uh, I probably shouldn't do that because I'm about to say who the earlier speakers have been, but I have to say that it's probably topped a little by the caliber uh, of uh, this morning's group. Uh, the first two events of the Strand Group, uh, we had speakers, the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, Sir Nick McPherson, uh, and Chief Economic Advisor, Sir Dave Ramsden, both visiting professors at King's who gave wonderful talks. Now, Sir Michael, of course, Sir Michael Barber has been invited all around the world uh, to discuss his new book, uh, but I'm not sure that there's been another occasion uh, when the Right Honourable Tony Blair has been the respondent, but I stand to be corrected. So, without further ado, uh, thank you all for coming, but I think will be a, a wonderful event. Uh, and over to Dr. John Davis, Director of the Strand Group, uh, to share Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to King's. This is the third Strain Group event, the signature seminar series of the Policy Institute at King's. Um, let me just reiterate that uh, sponsorship from Hewlett Packard, truly, without which these things would not happen, certainly not in the way that they do. Um, I think that I'd like to just um, veer away from my normal, extremely Spartan uh, uh, chairing, just to point out a few things here. Um, what you see here, this event, came out of a conversation that Michael and I had about three years ago. Um, when I die on my gravestone, it'll say, you know, John got there eventually. You know, I get there, but it takes me a while. Um, and what Michael did was he said to me, I thought he was going to offer me a job, but he did um, He said that he'd kept a diary when he was in Downing Street, and my eyes shot up, and he said, John, would you like to actually handle this? And I'm like, oh, yes. And, <laughs> Um, what Michael immediately uh, thought was that it wasn't just an edited um, a, a diary for publication. It could form the basis of quite an extraordinary PhD project. And that started to get me thinking about how we would do this. And eventually, our great friends at Hewlett-Packard uh, agreed to sponsor this. So we have, um, and this is, as you can see, this sort of like um, a, a virtuous circle where we have appointed Michelle Clement, who is the events manager for the Strain Group, but in a, <laughs> most, of, most of her time, what she is, is a PhD candidate looking at these diaries. Um, so on the one, you know, this is where I think we've got a, like a, a perfect triangle here, as the princi principal was pointing out, where on the one point, we have the excellence of the teaching at King's. Next, we have 
the government input from Michael, uh, and thirdly, we have the commercial triangle. And this is, uh, from my point of view, what I've been trying to do over many years now. Now, this morning, we can also uh, announce um, another new module for the Institute of Contemporary British History. And uh, this one is um, a recreation, dare I say it, uh, a, a, a development um, of the Blair Years course that we had previously. Um, and what this will see is a minute analysis of the man on my left. Um, <laughs> uh, he was history from the moment we did it. It's wonderful. Um, the, uh, the visiting professor, John Rentoul, and I will co-teach every week for 10 weeks an, anal an analysis of the, of the 97, 07 years. Um, but that's not enough for us, and I can see several alumni from our previous incarnations in the audience. Um, what we also do is to invite those who have actually done government uh, into the classroom on top. And so we've already got confirmations that people like Michael, Peter Mandelson, Andrew Adonis, Margaret Jay, Sir Kevin Tevitt, and Sir Nick McPherson, amongst others, will come and guest lecture on that particular course. So we're absolutely delighted to announce that this morning. Let me talk about the third bit of the triangle. We've got two HP-sponsored bursaries to go with it. So we're very pleased about that. I would say that this is partnership, and I'd echo the words, it's exactly what universities should be doing. But on to the main event. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to have Michael and Tony with us at King's. Michael, a very simple question. You've written many times on delivery. Why this new book? Uh, well, thank you, John, and thank you very much for coming. Um, the, uh, just to say, um, John is a classic <coughs> entrepreneur in the higher education sector, and um, what you've heard from him is, is um, a beautiful example of how these pieces can be put together to create something of uh, real value. And I think that the, the new course here will be um, a huge um, attraction uh, for King's, which already has that marvelous um, background in public policy and social science. Uh, look, I, I wrote the book because since um, I worked for Tony in Downing Street, which was a seminal four years for me, uh, uh, and it turned out that what we were doing in relation to delivery of domestic policy was an innovation. I'm not sure if we knew that at the time. We knew it was uh, working and making a difference, but it turned out to be an innovation. And since then, partly as a result of Tony's work, partly as a result of my work, partly as a result of people just reading about it, lots of governments have got into trying to become more effective at implementation and delivery. Um, and so there's now a body of knowledge out there um, uh, which sometimes mockingly gets called deliverology, which is the science of delivery. And it's not a perfect science because politics is full of um, interhuman relationships and conflict and all of that. But there's a body of knowledge that is um, useful uh, to governments. And if governments apply that knowledge, they will deliver better results. Uh, and so I wanted to write a book that wasn't just for the insiders in academia, that wasn't just for the insiders in government, but that was for people who were interested in government and politics, may never uh, actually work in government, may never uh, want to read an academic book or do an academic course, but they'd like to know how government could be more effective, and that's what the book is written for. So it's, a, it's a, written for a, a wide audience. It is, um, it's got examples from throughout history. It's got examples from every continent on the planet in the contemporary world, uh, and it's tried to distill that into uh, some lessons that would make a big difference. And I, I just want to say a couple of other things about this, John. I think the effectiveness of government is one of the big moral issues of our time. Um, if you read the, the sort of uh, political philosophy of the last 200 years, a lot of it is about um, preserving liberty from government, and that is a necessary strand of political thinking, un undoubtedly. But what, what we've seen in the last um, 10 years, more vividly perhaps than, than in the previous uh, 20 or 30 years, is just how important government is, either when you face a major economic financial crisis, uh, where with, with, without government action, uh, the world would have been in a lot of trouble, or in more extreme cases, uh, where you look at northern Nigeria or Somalia uh, or um, parts of the Middle East now, and you see what life is like uh, when government fails completely. Um, and 
you begin to think that maybe Thomas Hobbes had a point uh, uh, when he talked about what happened when uh, government was totally absent. So the effectiveness of government is a big moral issue and people are more likely to lead fulfilled lives, uh, flourish, uh, get on with each other uh, and succeed in doing whatever they want to do if government is effective. Whether or not you want big government or small government is then a legitimate political choice debated all around the world, debated in our recent election campaign uh, and, and most election campaigns around the world. But whether you want big government or small government being effective at the government role is really important. And if you go through the small government role, it's still quite substantial. Uh, governing markets, uh, re regulating, uh, breaking up monopolies, um, pr protecting individual liberty, uh, a court system that functions, that defends property rights and individual rights and so on. All of these things make a huge difference to individual people's lives. So it's a big moral issue, and the effectiveness of government, whether you want big or small government, is a really important um, aspect of this. And then in the book, I've tried to distill out uh, the things that governments can do to be more effective. Um, and uh, the, the, the final point, just to, to, to refer to the current situation in Britain, I think that, um, in, uh, as I was saying earlier, in Tony's second term, uh, we, uh, it turned out, became world leaders in uh, governing for outcomes. So setting some clear, ambitious goals that were difficult to meet, making progress towards them, uh, and uh, in many cases delivering them, not all cases, but making real progress. And that turned out to be a global innovation that's now been copied uh, or learned from or built upon by many governments around the world. And by the way, that approach is only in its infancy. Uh, every now and again, I read something that, that, as though that phase has passed. We're, we're, we're about, we're just at the beginning of that. But then in the, um, in the Cameron coalition government that finished in uh, the, just before the election, they actually were quite effective at controlling costs, and somebody needed to do that. We were, I think you, you, you would agree, Tony, less effective at that. We were in a period of growth in, economy, in, in the economy. We were spending more public money. So we were good at governing to outcomes, and the coalition government uh, learned how to be effective at controlling costs. The agenda for the Cameron government now is to put those two things together. And the chapter eight of the book, which is called Other People's Money, is about combining delivering for outcomes with controlling costs, and basically arguing that um, the investment for reform era, which was the era when uh, Tony was prime minister uh, and at his most successful, is now challenged by a kind of more for less agenda. And I've tried to set out in chapter eight of the book how you could do that. And I think if the Cameron government puts those two things together, um, it could uh, uh, show the way forward for lots of other governments as well. A last question just to you, uh, Michael. Um, it seems to me, having followed the books and read them <coughs> pretty assiduously, um, it seems to me that what you're doing is something quite, um, quite different that you're going over the same turf again and again, but layering on new elements. And there seems to be a great deal more history to this particular book, many more examples. Would you agree? Yeah, so, so well, it's true, that, it's true that you're going over the same ground, but the, but the ground is moving, and the understanding of the ground is moving, and the, and the era of austerity is different from the era of economic growth, and that needs to be factored in. But I've brought the history in to try and make it um, popular it also made it more fun for me to write because I'm, I'm a historian and so you come across these little anecdotes and you think actually that's a telling piece of deliverology so Calvin Coolidge not one of the world's most uh, successful uh, America's most successful president turns out that he his ambition was to cut government expenditure that's what he was elected to do that's what he set out to do every Friday he had what Tony and I would have called a stock take with his budget director where they cut public expenditure line by line him and his budget director, so much so that if you were a civil servant in uh, Coolidge's America, you'd get given a pencil that long. And if you wanted to get it replaced from government stores, you had to take a stub of a pencil less than half an inch long back to the stores. Uh, and they wouldn't give you one unless you got down to that level. So those civil servants in the audience who think you've had it tough in the last five years, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then the other anecdote, which I really, uh, I, I needed an anecdote to get into the other people's money chapter, the controlling public expenditure, and I was searching for one, and then um, somebody mentioned it, and I, and I went back and read the Old Testament. Joseph in the Old Testament is the classic deliverer. 
So he, he's in, if you remember the story, he's in prison and the, and the pharaoh has a dream that there's seven fat cows and seven thin cows and he wakes up in the morning and he says to the court, I've had this dream, what does it mean? And none of them know, and they're all terrified of him. And then one of them says, well, none of us know, but there's this bloke in prison who's really good at dreams and they drag Joseph in front of the pharaoh and they sling him on the ground in front of the pharaoh. And he says, I know exactly what your dream means. There's going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So what you've got to do in the seven years of plenty is save 20% of the corn a year. Tony O'Connor is sitting here would call that a trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then you'll be ready for the seven years of famine. And the pharaoh says, I know you're only 30, Joseph, but get out there. You can have my second best chariot. I don't want you hanging around in the palace. I want you to be out of the front line. And by the way, build a delivery chain of people in every region that you can deliver this stuff. <laughs> and he goes off and does it. And then after three years, this is what it says, uh, he'd been counting the corn, but the corn was without number. We'd call that a head of trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then when the seven years of plenty ends, Joseph doesn't give the corn to the Egyptian people. He sells it to them. No welfare dependency. <laughs> <laughs> they come from all around the region. He sells it to them. They solve their balance of payments project. The, the dream was a treasury forecast. <laughs> Nobody said an end to boom and bust. Uh, and Joseph got on and delivered. And um, Tony spends some time in Egypt these days. Egypt would love to have some sort of, <laughs> of that kind now. So yes, the, the history is designed to make it fun and entertaining and interesting and uh, examples. still reflecting on Joseph and why we didn't pay more attention to that. <laughs> um, and also the fact that I've learned today that, that there are diaries. <laughs> so Michelle, good luck with uh, editing. If you want any help, uh, my help is available. <laughs> um, I hope they are more discreet than Alistair's. Let me just <laughs> <laughs> say that, because that red pen didn't always work. Um, delivery is more important than before. Um, Michael is absolutely right, by the way, that this is a, a subject that's just in its infancy. Um, you know, I do work in about 18 different countries today. All of them are focused on the issue of delivery. And all of them basically have the very similar types of problems. One of the things you find with countries is that they, they think their problems are unique and they're almost certainly not. And certainly, even if the circumstances are unique, the necessity of focusing on getting the right priorities, getting the right policies to meet them, and performers managing the outcomes are absolutely standard right, everywhere. And, you know, Michael's work with, with us was, I think, quite revolutionary, uh, more so than we realized at the time. And one of the odd things is that you go around, the, well, rather disconcertingly, people say to me, it's wonderful to see you, but you don't happen to know Michael Barber, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, actually, I do. They, 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 even there are prime ministers and presidents who come to me with the previous book. Um, and the interesting thing about this book, I think, is it takes now, more contemporary examples. So the last book looked at what we did in government, but now there are much more contemporary examples happening around the world. And this is just literally what government's about. Uh, and I was fascinated by the process of it. Um, one other thing that's really interesting is many presidencies or pri premierships um, have a, what I call a dual track quality to them over time. What I mean by that is, there is one dominant issue that arises for whatever reason. And that dominant issue, if the prime minister or president isn't careful, then excludes focus on what I would call the day-to-day -day yeah. things that matter in all people's ordinary lives. Right. So for me, post 9-11, that was a huge thing. It then led Afghanistan, Iraq, all the different things that we had to do. That was a dominant issue in respect to which I had to spend a large amount of time, what the delivery unit and that idea gave me was the ability, at the same time as I was trying to spend a certain amount of time on, on this huge issue to do with the post-9-11 world, it allowed the government, the government then to focus on 
health, education, law and order, the things that, that for many people's ordinary lives were far more important to them. I was just in Nigeria recently with the new uh, president-elect there. He has got this massive security question around Boko Haram, how he deals with it. What, what, uh, this is going to occupy a large amount of his time. It's in many ways going to define a large part of his presidency. Um, but at the same time, he's got to reform his public services. Sorry, someone's... I don't think I'm just, there's no movement in there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's Hewlett Packard, so I mean, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about this here now, I've, John. I've got to say, they've not, you know, it's the service side that's not so right. <laughs> um, So there's, there's a... Uh, for, for him, alongside this huge issue to do with Boko Haram, he's got to deal with reforming his energy sector, his agriculture sector, delivering basic services. And this is going to require a system of government that allows him to do that. So this is why this delivery thing is, is, is so important. And it, it actually most, you know, you end up, most of the problems of government come from people being overwhelmed by the size and scale of what they have to do. So this is, this is why these things are so important. And literally, around the world, wherever I am, people are interested in, in these ideas. Well, I think it's time to open this up to the audience. Uh, can I have a very clear question? Can I have a uh, name and affiliation, please? And can you please wait for the mic? I can see a gentleman over there. Michael Nick you've talked mainly about uh, deliberation at national level. But it seems to me that an awful lot of policy issues now at national level, climate change and so on, are determined. Is there anything that you can say on how deliberate is best organized at that level, given the added complexity of mass career? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and the answer is there isn't really a mechanism for doing, for doing that at an international level, apart from the UN, which is a system that, let us say, has its challenges. Um, and you know, one of the things I think that the international leadership finds very difficult, right? Because International leaders want to deal with global issues. On the other hand, they're nervous of transferring their power to some other body. I mean, you can see this in the debates over the European Union, but it's, it's the same psychological anxiety that leaders have. It's why you tend to get a debate for the UN Secretary General. You know, people say, right, let's choose someone who is going to be able to drive through real change, and then the countries that have to make the decision get a little nervous of what that might mean. Um, and I think, for example, climate change, but I would say also on issues to do today with global terrorism, there is a need for at least some capacity at an international level, uh, maybe you put it together on, on an ad hoc basis, in order to drive through some of the changes that's necessary. So just as a, for example, the United States and China at the moment who have agreed to collaborate on the issue of clean energy and climate change, they're get, they're, they are actively looking at how they manage to take those broad pronouncements they've made and turn them into reality. So you, you actually, at an international level, you really do with some of these global challenges, just not have the internationally coordinated capacity to meet them. I, 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 agree, I agree with all of that. And just, just one, one other point. I think the, the, the European Commission right now would really benefit from delivery thinking in the programs it manages. You know, if, if, if there's anywhere in the world that could do with a delivery unit for the stuff that's already agreed, not the big geopolitical, um, but, but the stuff that the Commission is meant to deliver, they would be a lot more effective if they had a delivery mindset. George Jones, LSE. In deliverability, what does Michael think the role of decentralization and devolution can be? I would suggest it has a lot to do with it because, as has been mentioned, if you centralize everything within government and between central and territories, problems are unmanageable the center becomes overwhelmed. And uh, I haven't read this latest book. I've always thought you were perhaps too 
centralized, I remember calling your style of thought barbarism, <laughs> because it <laughs> neglected the role of decentralized organizations, particularly those that were democratically accountable. I can't imagine why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you, thank you um, for, for a, a, a nice summary of my um, uh, emerging theme of uh, school of thought. But the, um, but look, I, I, but what I, I actually do debate this in the in the book, Jordan, in the new book, Jordan. You might you might want to have a look at it and, and see whether you agree or not. But the, what I would argue is, even if your goal as a British government were to decentralise. Um, having a delivery unit would help you get that done. So the, the point of the delivery unit, exactly as Tony just described it, prime ministers are going to be dominated by whatever the issues of the day are. They're going to have to get that done. But they also want to deliver an agenda that they were elected to deliver. And because they're going to be distracted, whether it's um, in this parliament by the whole agenda of the European Union or back then by 9-11 and the consequences of that, if they get overwhelmed by that, they'll get nothing done. If the agenda is to deliver devolution, having somebody in Downing Street making sure that that agenda is moving forward will be really important. So actually, I, I, I argue in the book that, of course, the delivery agenda takes them the position of looking from the center of government outwards. But it doesn't matter whether you want to decentralize or centralize. Uh, having that capacity would be a good thing. And then there's a separate debate, and these two things get modeled, not by you, but, but often in the debate. There's a question about the centralization of government around number 10 and the cabinet office in relation to departments, which is one debate. And then there's another debate about how much you want to devolve to local government regions, uh, uh, nations. And those are uh, separate debates. And incidentally, uh, just that while, while we're on this, the Scottish um, government a uh, couple of years ago introduced a kind of delivery unit, I don't know if they call it that, into their health service because they were behind England on health outcomes and they've now caught up again. So you can apply this thinking at any level in government uh, and it's not centralizing by definition. It's a way of making sure you get stuff done that needs to be done. Uh, sorry, jo John Rental, uh, professor here. Um, can I ask uh, Tony what he thinks of the implementation unit which David Cameron has uh, introduced and uh, last week, um, which sets up uh, 10 task forces of, uh, of ministers to oversee the implementation of 10 targets including um, Well it depends how look it depends how it's constituted um, I don't, I don't know about task forces and ministers, really. <laughs> I mean, it, it can work if it's not just another ministerial committee, right? If it, if it is, then it's, 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 I'm not sure it will deliver. I think it's very important to understand why the delivery unit works and where it works and where it doesn't. It works when you have the clearest possible sense of the priorities you want to achieve. Okay, let's assume that's reasonably easy to do. It works when you have really good, capable people and strong leadership in the unit itself, right? That's a lot harder to achieve. And I think you need a mix of insiders and outsiders for that. Because I think, you know, there are many really great civil servants who if you give them a little bit of space and ability to innovate will innovate very well. But I also think because there are so many practices about change management that are developed in the private sector that you need, you know, you need some peopling of that unit with quality people from the outside as well, or indeed from the voluntary sector. Um, the third thing is you've got to have the prime minister's authority behind this all the time. And my, I, I have this view about centralization and, and not, because I think it's, it's got relevance to whether this thing works or not. As Michael rightly says, there's two different aspects. The centralization within government, right, how much power comes into the center and Downing Street, and then there's de decentralization, the sense of devolution and so on. Okay. My view is, then just based on my practical experience, 
is that you need a certain, you need the capability at the centre for the Prime Minister independently to know what's going on and to be able to drive through change. Because what you find in government is that some departments get it and really move to make the changes that are necessary. But even they help get help from having the authority of the Prime Minister behind it. And then you get some, frankly, the little more sleepy, let's say, and then you really need that power to kind of galvanize and to drive. So I'm not against sort of ministerial ta task forces and so on, and ministerial committees. I mean, all of that ha has its place, but I do think the guy at the top's got to be driving it the whole time. In respect of when you then come to devolution of government, I just want to make th th this point because I think this is really important. The, the dilemma is this. If you devolve power to, um, to a, a region or to a nation within the UK or to local authorities, and you devolve power in circumstances where there is a really vibrant accountability debate locally, you are likely to get people who will compete on the best outcomes for the local people. Right. But what sometimes happens is that people think that decentralization itself delivers. Now, decentralization didn't deliver anything unless the people to whom you're decentralizing get the job done better. And the worry I always had was, you decentralize, and I've seen this happen with governments around the world, they think that, and they get advised by the international sort of community decentralize, and they decentralize to group people and don't do anything. So that's not a great outcome. So the, the, the tension there always is, if you have a very strong agenda you want to drive through government, your tension is always that if you rely on ministries too much, or you rely on devolution of power too much, the job doesn't get, doesn't get done. So this is the tension that there is. So I don't know enough about how, you know, the the Prime Minister set up this implementation unit and the ministerial task forces and so on. But what I do absolutely know is that the only thing that will work is having a very clear idea of what you want to achieve, having really capable people, not including ministers for these purposes, who are absolutely focused on getting the job done, and then having your own authority delivered directly to that system that, that, that backs it up. Yeah, so I, I would reinforce all of that, John, and, and say um, the, if the Prime Minister wants his task forces and his new implementation unit to work and is powered up in a way that it wasn't in the, in the previous parliament, he, he personally will have to pay attention to it. it. It doesn't need a lot of time, but it needs routine, consistent time applied to it so that everybody knows that the Prime Minister is on the case. So that's, that's point one. Um, I sent him a copy of my book, and obviously if he reads it and applies the lessons, it will work. <laughs> Michelle Clement, does delivery work outside the domestic agenda? Um, it could do, provided what you're trying to deliver has, has a clear, you know, you clearly identified the measurable outcome, I think. Yeah. So you, you, you could do that. And by the way, I think you can apply some of the science of delivery <coughs> to security issues, certainly to things like defense capability, probably could do. Um, so yeah, no, I think it can do. But the essence always of it is, is that you're very clear about what you want to achieve, and then you're focused on the practical business of achieving it. And, you know, I think one of the things that I would say to people about government is government is hard, by the way. I mean, government is actually a lot harder than people think. And how are some experiences the sort of outside world as well as the inside world? You know, you, you meet lots of really smart business people, but I tell you, government's as hard as any of the things they're trying to do and not a lot harder. And so that's why I think, you know, it's very sensible for us to be thinking now, because in a sense, you know, government, only in the last 70 years or so has government come to be such a big part of the delivery of your basic services and, you know, such an important, you know, part of the way a country functions. 
And it would be odd if we weren't learning lessons and there wasn't a development of a whole intellectual body of thought around how government itself works. So I don't see any reason why it shouldn't apply outside. I, I, so I, I agree with that, and I think the, um, the, like some of the, the elements of delivery apply to any aspect of government where you want to make a change. So uh, I have this whole chapter called Routines, which is about meetings. I was thinking, how am I going to make a chapter about routines and meetings? <laughs> Interesting. So I started looking for anecdotes. I mentioned um, Calvin Coolidge, but there's a, there's a bit that I came across in the history of MI5, so well beyond the... The, the kind of d ordinary domestic policy agenda. They're sitting around in 1943 saying, why doesn't Churchill pay us more attention? And then one of them says, well, maybe we could write him a monthly note. Exactly. Uh, and everything. And then they say, one of them says, well, it, he'll never, you know, you know what Churchill, he says, they'll never read it unless it's well written. Again, we had that debate in the, I, we, we, Jeremy and I thought we'd invented monthly notes, but no, they've been done in 1943. And so they say, well, who could we get to write our monthly note then? And they say, oh, I know, this is a really handsome guy. Everybody loves him. He's a great writer. He's called Anthony Blunt. <laughs> this is true. This is absolutely true. So Anthony Blunt, from 1943 to 1945, wrote the monthly note for Churchill, cleared it with Stalin's agents, and then sent it to the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, um, by the way, Tony, while we're on this, the first monthly note from MI5 to Churchill, he wrote on the bottom, deeply interesting. <laughs> you never wrote that on one of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anthony Blunt wasn't writing them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Ros Kelly. Um, as you can hear from the accent, um, I'm one of its colleagues. I was cabinet minister in the Australian Labor government. And my question to the panelists is, um, do you think that we've taken politicization of the civil service too far and therefore distracted from the ability of the civil service to deliver? What do we mean by politicizing the civil service? We're we, we in Australia to the appointment yeah. of permanent secretaries yeah. by, by politicians and, and so on. I, I mean, we, we, we've got a couple of very senior civil servants from the Blair eras in the, in the front row. I, I personally, I don't think that the civil service was politicised in the Blair era, and I don't think it was. I don't, I, so I'm not sure that is a trend in Britain, but in, um, in, 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 in uh, obviously in the US, it's always been there. And then the, and, and in, in, in uh, things, but things have happened though uh, under the co coalition government, though, right, in terms of the more. Right. Um, secretary yeah. for five years, um, yeah. uh, and then yeah. the list that they get to choose from. I mean, just to get to an express a view, I think there is. You're drawing attention to a risk, which um, and um, you're right to draw attention to it because you can be a minister and you can be frustrated with the, the civil service, and this is true all around the world. So I'm not making a comment about Britain, uh, and then you can politicize it because you think that's the solution and then you probably regret it uh, at leisure as other governments come and go uh, really and yeah. I mean, really yeah yeah he was yeah. one of the young people yeah, <laughs> yeah and I'm, I'm in favor of that yeah. I mean look I, I think there's a difference in politicization in the sense that you put someone in a position because they share your ideological politics right that's a bad idea okay you put someone in the position because they get what you're trying to do and they're good implementers, that to me is a good thing. And so I think you know, there, there, there is a, a new deal that you need to put at the heart of the way politicians interact with civil servants today. And part of that deal is that you, you actually have a greater interaction, in my view, between the civil service, the voluntary, the private sector. I mean, I think people benefit from different experiences. Um, and actually when they bring those into government, government's enhanced for it. But I think the other side of that deal is that you, the politicians actually stand behind the civil servants when they're innovating, when they're doing difficult things. <clears throat> and, you know, I've come across systems that are paralyzed, not by politicization in that, in the sort of very crude way, but paralyzed by the fact that 
paralyze them because the civil servants actually don't dare take a decision because they have no belief that their political masters will ever stand behind them if something then gets difficult. And I think this is so right. you have a different way of thinking about public service and the way government works. And one of the things that I think is so important about debating government, and it's probably why, by the way, there are so many, you know, this group, you've got the Institute of Governments sprouting up all over the place, is because everybody in government today, you know, if they're sensible about it, look, a lot of government today is not ideological, really. It is about practical solutions. It's about working out, you know, it's about working out what is it that, it that is going to make a real difference in the modern world? It's about knowing about the new ideas and innovations that are out there. So for example, I will say to people that the impact of technology on the whole of the private sector has been absolutely revolutionary. And in the next few years, it's going to be even more revolutionary, big data and so on. It would be bizarre. to politicize the civil service in the sense that I want a Labour Party to there, rather a Tory party there, and I don't care about that at all. I mean, some people care enough about it, but, <laughs> but I, I really didn't. What I did care about was whether someone came in and could contribute because they were thinking imaginatively and creatively and they were prepared to innovate and they realized the world's changing fast and so we have to change with it. Now, that, that's the bit that, so how you, how you get the, the institution of government to think about change, I think is really, really important. And, and um, Michael was surprisingly quoting Calvin Coolidge. Let me um, surprisingly quote as an authority on the challenge of government, um, one uh, Chinggis Khan, um, who, who once said, it's in character, um, who once said that, that um, conquering the world on horseback was easy. The hard part was when you had to dismount and govern. And actually, I mean, this is, you know, the fact is when you're trying to do the, grapple that process of government, that's where you need creativity. So politicization in a sort of crude way, absolutely not. Opening the system up to new people, new ideas, that is, to me, of the essence. Yeah, and actually underpinning all of, all of that, um, it, the way in which relationships are formed inside government, the, 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 uh, which we thought about a lot in the original delivery, and I talk about in the book, it, uh, uh, of when something's going wrong, you don't want um, politicians yelling and, um, or people going from the Prime Minister's office saying the Prime Minister's incandescent about X, Y, and Z. You need, you need to focus on solving the problem, uh, and you need to create circumstances where civil servants will come with ideas, some of which may get shot down, but they'll keep coming with ideas because that's where the, where the innovation will come from. Um, and I, I, I've, in, in the work I've been doing in Pakistan, I've seen big changes in that, where a few years ago, people were really afraid to go to the chief minister with anything, uh, especially if it was bad news. And now there's a proper debate about those things. When they're going wrong, we have a genuine debate about it. And that, that is really important to getting these relationships right. Let's have a senior civil servant right at the back of the not any longer a senior civil servant. Alan Evans, uh, Chief Executive of the British Secretary. Academy, but for many years a civil servant. Um, I think Michael makes the case strongly for delivery in the delivery <coughs> union, and it clearly proved its worst in the, in the Blair years. But my question is, is there a risk that this process may mean you do not concentrate enough on the long-term problems rather than some of the short-term pressing issues? And let me just give one example. Uh, we have a big debate at the moment about delivering high speed two. Uh, arguably, in 1997 or early in the, the Blair years, uh, building a commitment to uh, high-speed rail would have been a very sensible thing to do, but the pressing problems of the time on health and education meant that the focus of the delivery unit was elsewhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good question. I think you, the, there is a risk of that, but that's why you need other dimensions. So one of the things I'm absolutely sure that government should have the capacity, and this is where, by the way, interaction with those outside government is important. The capacity to think through new ideas, which are going to be longer term and maybe more revolutionary in their impact. So for example, today, in, and actually I think that the new head of the NHS, uh, Simon Stevens, who was my health advisor in Downing Street, is doing this, but today in the health service, you'd have to look at what the impact of technology could be on how the service is delivered. Now that's not a delivery unit function. It's a, what I would call a strategic policy function. 
but we should definitely have that in government. Yeah, and, 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 and um, in the play, there was a strategy in it looking at some of those long-term um, issues, including transport, actually, at, at one point in the second term. So I, I think that, that does need to be done. But what, what, it, could, it could have the, the flaw you describe. It doesn't need to. So if you take climate change and you set some target for 2050, um, you could still have a delivery. If you just leave a target for 2050, the risk is that everybody will leave it till 2035 and then sort of wake up and panic, as it were. But if you, if you took the target for 2050 and said to the current um, relevant department, well, to get that target in 2050, where do we have to get to by 2020? And what would that look like? And what are we trying to do? You could, a delivery unit could monitor that agenda towards the long term. So it's, it's, it's perfectly plausible to use delivery to drive towards a long term goal. Let's squeeze one last question. Tom Robinson. Um, if I may, can I take you back to decentralisation? Here you go. To decentralisation and devolution. Um, you're just talking about the NHS and. Peter Mandelson, the uh, Prince of Darkness himself, um, has recently said that Labour missed a beat as regards uh, devolution. If I present you the Devo Mank uh, deal and uh, devolving to the uh, uh, combined authority of Greater Manchester, can I ask specifically what you think about that deal and also the idea of devolving six billion pounds of NHS spending to the region? I've actually been principal in favour, I think. Of, of devolving like that. I think it's, it's the right way. Um, <clears throat> it's the right way to go, but it does depend on the, the capability and the leadership at a local level, which in the case of Manchester is there. Um, if it's not there, you'll end up with a problem. And that's why I say you actually need a vibrant system of accountability locally. Because what needs to happen is if people don't do the job, then there's enough, uh, as, there's enough energy in the local politics to then force change. Um, but no, I, I, I'm, I'm, look, I think there's a, a case for, again, when, you, when you're thinking about decentralization, devolution, to look at that a lot more imaginatively and not in a very static way. But, you know, I was, we, we did major devolutions and, uh, and, you know, there's obviously a lot of the debate concentrates on Scotland and, and, and Wales and Northern Ireland. But, you know, the mayoral system was a devolution too, by the way. I mean, you know, we created the London mayor. Um, and you, know, you, you, you look at, at how devolution works, it works best when you have a, when it's clear that there is that, that local politics and community that is going to, to debate solutions and which can then provide a, the right contest politically ideas for the future. Where in my view it doesn't work is when you devolve into a politics that's not really capable of generating much change and people just you know, take the power <laughs> and don't use it properly. So, you know, I think one of the things that's really important, and I'm always saying this to people in the Scottish and Welsh connection, and one of the reasons I always wanted the Labour Party, both in Scotland and in Wales, to be very, you know, new Labour perhaps, is there a, well, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. But, <laughs> but you know, I wanted them always to be on the mod progressive side, challenging the status quo in their own politics, because that was going to lead to a much more vibrant debate then over people who either didn't want to change the system or wanted to say everything was the fault of Westminster. When clearly, you know, when you devolve, actually that, the whole point is the local people then take responsibility. So this, I think, is a really, really important part of, of the political debate going forward. And, and I'm basically in favor of that devolution, but it's only gonna work in circumstances where the local politics is capable of handling it and handling a, a really good energetic debate about what works and what doesn't. So just specifically for me, I, I thought the, um, when uh, George Osborne um, made that deal in the run-up to the election. That was a bold stroke by the government, one of, one of, the, one of their boldest of the five-year parliament, actually, and it will have big implications. And I, I, I agree with what Tony said. I just want to say one thing, though, about this as a general issue, not just in this country, but more broadly, 
It's not just where you devolve power to, it's the relationships between the elements in the system. And too often people just debate the kind of blobs, I'm giving right. power from here to there, but can you get the relationships between the elements to work well? That is a really important part of a division agenda, and it often gets missed out of the debate. Okay, well, I apologize to those who had hands up. Um, I will appreciate that time is limited. Um, personally, and this, I think says a little lot about me, this is my heaven for me. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> Heaven's got to be better than this. Yeah. No, come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> For a start, it's got to be a little more mixed in my view. But... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, <don't. laughs> Thank you all for coming. Please do join us for the reception. Michael has got a lot of books out there on. I do recommend you buy them. Um, can I ask you to stay in your seats and to join with me in thanking Sir Michael Barber and Tony.